Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this presentation of Sag Moraine Native Plant Community. We're very happy that you could join us tonight, and I hope you're all getting excited like we are for spring gardening season, which is upon us, just about. Uh, tonight, we will be presenting a designer's guide to native landscaping with native plants. Uh, we're really excited about our special guests tonight. Uh, but before I introduce um, our special guests, I just want to go over a few areas of business. Um, for those of you who are new to SAG Moraine, we are an all-volunteer 501c3 nonprofit organization. We're located in the southwest and near west suburbs of Chicago, but we pretty much will talk about native plants anywhere in the Chicago area that there is a person that will listen. Um, our Sag Moraine is dedicated to the restoration of life-supporting habitat one plant at a time. We envision a future where native plants are embraced for their beauty, environmental impact, and inspiring a grassroots movement towards responsible stewardship of urban landscapes. Just a few items, a few things that Sag Moraine has coming up in the relatively near future in this, this spring. Uh, we are partnering with the Illinois Monarch Project and the Brookfield Zoo to bring a series of spring uh, educational events, both in person and online. Uh, two of the online events that we will be participating in are a free webinar on March 27th at 7 p.m., uh, Why Monarchs Matter and How We Can Help, and then uh, kind of a little bit of a continuation on from the thoughts tonight of creating a, a native garden. We'll have the ins and outs of creating a native pollinator garden that will be on Wednesday, April 24th, again, both at 7 p.m. And I do want to mention our spring, our third annual spring native plant sale that will be coming up on June 1st. Uh, there will be thousands of plants available that day for individual purchase, both from Stellar Natives and Midwest Ground Covers. Um, but we also have the pre-sale portion of the plant sale. And this year we have nine different garden packages available for different size locations and different, different sites. Um, also for anybody who watches the webinar, um, and places your order by March 27th. Um, we're offering a 10% discount on any plant package purchases. Just put the code designers10 in the um, in at checkout. Now, speaking of our plant sale and our garden packages, uh, we are thrilled to have with us tonight the designers of those garden designs that went with those packages. Uh, we have with us Jeremy Ohms of Wild World Gardens. Jeremy believes that uh, gardens can be a meaningful spaces for healing and connection. After acquiring a certificate in horticulture therapy from the Chicago Botanic Garden in 2018, Jerry star Jeremy started Wild World Gardens to share his love of gardening with others and to help them transform their landscapes into beautiful and beneficial ecosystems filled with food, medicine and connection to local wildlife. Also with us tonight, we have Keith Sikora from Stellar Natives. After 10 years of experience in the ecological restoration industry, Keith founded Stellar Native Plant Nursery in 2022. The mission of Stellar Natives is to increase the use and availability of native plants throughout the greater Chicago area, Chicago land area. Their plan is to be a resource for homeowners to purchase native plants for their properties and provide expert advice to the public on selecting the right native plants for their needs. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce our guests of this evening, Jeremy Ohms and Keith Sikora. Welcome, gentlemen. Hello, welcome. Hello, Hello. Jeremy. Thank you for having us, me. Oh. Thank you for joining us. We're we're so excited to hear to hear the ideas and the um the creative thoughts of the designers themselves. <laughs> well, yeah, we're we're happy to share. 
Hey, hey, Keith. And there's Keith. Here I am. Oh, yeah. Are you <laughs> Sorry, in the <laughs> Yeah. Amazing. And that really is a photo of Keith's greenhouse. Yeah, I took that one this morning. So, yeah. <laughs> he did Wi-Fi <laughs> in his greenhouse. Perfect. Um, great. Well, yeah, so we're so honored to be here, Kathy. Uh, always wonderful to work with Sag Moraine. You all do such great work advocating for native plants and for native plant landscapes and uh, for our local in, you know ecosystems. So love love what you do. It's a pleasure. We have we have we have such a fun time doing it. I will stop sharing my screen and I'm going to let you share yours, Jeremy, and I will disappear for the time being. Okay. Sounds good. Um, so the way things are going to go here, um, I'm going to talk for a little while and then hand it over to Keith. And uh, he's going to talk for a little while about his designs and experience. And uh, then we're going to take some questions for a bit. So hopefully everyone can see this. Uh, my name is Jeremy. Uh, I am the owner and founder of Wild World Gardens. Um, we're a native plant landscaping design, consultation, installation, and stewardship, uh, you know, business, company, organization, and uh, mostly work uh, residential landscapes. And um, I founded, as Kathy mentioned, I founded uh, Wild World Gardens in 2019. Um, then the pandemic hit and kind of slowed down for a while. Uh, so really been like going at this since 2022 full time, uh, creating gardens and helping people in their home landscapes incorporate native plants into their existing gardens or starting new gardens. So first I want to talk about, uh, thought, I saw this graphic today and I thought it was pretty funny because you know happy spring everyone uh although it definitely uh we are feels like winter of discontent again this uh today this week um I think that will probably be followed by another false spring which will then be followed by probably some snow in April which usually happens uh so yeah it's been a warm winter, but still it's always long here in Chicago. And so we're very much looking forward to spring gardening, right? And hitting up those native plant sales, buying up a lot of native plants and starting our gardens or adding to what we already have. Uh, summer feels like it's so short compared to the winter, but there's plenty of time just to, you know, be patient and uh, good things will happen soon. So uh, I started Wild World Gardens kind of uh around three ideas um first i was you know wanting to create more habitat for pollinators uh in our home landscapes the other was thinking about how can we contribute how native plants contribute to the health of our ecosystems and home landscapes especially the soil water and air and then the big one for me with the background in horticultural therapy as well is uh thinking about how gardening in general can be a source of healing, but you know, especially around native plants and uh, sort of bringing those native plants back uh, home to where they once were, um, how that is uh, a, very much a source of healing for people and place. Um, kind of just to talk about that for a second, but you know, we are, so here in the city in Chicago in the suburbs, where it's, you know, more and more feeling disconnected from nature and uh, gardening, as I said, but also spe specifically native plant gardening is uh, such a source of, of healing and reconnection uh, to those sort of frayed ecosystems that we are trying to reestablish. Uh, and so native plant gardening for me, and I hope for all of you, is very much healing the environment around us and sort of these these wounds that have been created, uh, you know, for through just all sorts of reasons. Uh, um, and so, you know, that's one reason why native plants are so important. Um, I'm, I, I'm getting a little philo philosophical, but, uh, you know, I just wanted to put that out there. Uh, um, the other reason why native plants 
you know, are very important. And I kind of want to just talk about the why, and which I'm, no, I, I'm sure a lot of you are already on board, and I might be speaking to the choir, but just why are native, native plants important now more than ever, or have always been? Uh, and then I'll go into the how. You know, native plants, as we know, are, contribute to soil health. Uh, they enrich the soil. They feed the microbes. They control erosion. They improve the permeability of clay soil. So look at these native plants. I'm sure some of you have seen this graphic or a similar graphic where you see the root systems of, of plants like lead plant or cone flower or, you know, prairie drop seed compared to just turf grass, uh, which is not really helping our soil or sequestering carbon or anything like that. Um, and we have too much turf grass out there. And so how can we sort of shrink that and incorporate native plants uh, into our gardens or, you know, into our landscapes? Um, not only so soil health, but native plants really help with water health. Those deep roots that you just saw, they help absorb and filter water, remove pollutants before they enter waterways, slow down runoff, reduce flood water and storm water impacts, much more so than just turf grass and all the the pavement that is surrounding us, right? Uh, they also help our air quality. So they remove harmful contaminants from the air. Native plants are, are used a lot in remediation. Uh, so through for air, water, and soil. And obviously they remove carbon from the air and sequester it into the soil uh, a, a lot more efficiently than turf grass can. Um, you know, so that's that's sort of the healing and health part. And then what so many of us are passionate about is creating uh, a home and providing food and shelter for our pollinators and our wildlife. And they need native plants uh, in order to have those things. So why native plants? Pollinators, 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 other species too. Just like humans, pollinators need food, water, shelter, and space to survive. Native plants provide this habitat and support the needs of butterflies, birds, bees, beetles, moths, flies, wasps, hummingbirds, other species. These animals have co-evolved with these plants. The relationship between plants and pollinators is complex, intricate, interconnected, and interdependent. The beautiful dance of symbiosis, the disappearance of one can signal the extinction of the other. Uh, so recently, Sag Moraine hosted Doug Tallamy, who is an amazing native plant guru, advocate, entomologist. Um, and I don't know if you've ever read any of his books. This is the one that I would recommend out of, you know, I'd recommend all of them, but definitely start off with bringing nature home. But he talks a lot about garden as though life depends on it, right? Uh, and that's what your gardens should be. Uh, they should be a sanctuary and a haven for life. Um, and so native plants help you sustain that wildlife. Uh, here are some examples of the life that we're talking about, the, you know, and and what we're gardening for when we're gardening for native plants, bumblebees on wild bergamot, the leafcutter bees on purple coneflower. You have the rusty patch bumblebee here on Culver's root in the middle, which has been had an 87 percent decline in the last 20 years. Below that, ruby throated hummingbird on cardinal flowers. All of these pollinators. A lot of them are specialists that need certain plants, uh, you know, in order to survive. And so the more we can create biodiversity in our gardens and provide food and habitat for these insects and their young, um, you know, the more resilient, sustainable, or more uh, just dynamic and vibrant our local ecosystems will be. So, and then lastly, why native plants? You know, many of these species that I just showed are suffering. And we all know, we've all seen the, the statistics, um, so, you know, uh, and their populations are declining for a number of reasons. But due to climate change, which, you know, the, I feel like this whole past winter has just been an ode to climate instability with the ups and downs and the weather patterns that we've had. Uh, pesticide use, disease, habitat loss. So really what we need to do, and Doug Ptolemy will always say this, is we need to create habitat, right? We have 130 million parcels of residential land in the United States. I think if we put all of our turf grass together, that's bigger than the state of Georgia. So imagine all of us coming together to restore those lost biomes that once existed and giving uh, these all these species a, a home. Um, so I, I really always like this uh, 
picture here, each plant in your garden could be a lifeline for local wildlife. Um, so we kind of have to get past this mindset of gardening just for beauty and aesthetics. Um, obviously that's important and we want to be intentional and show some intentionality and good design uh, to turn people on to this type of gardening. But really what it comes down to is providing life uh, and giving, providing those lifelines for local wildlife and the pollinators and birds and the species that depend on these plants and these landscapes. Um, and this is a, a quote that I pulled from that Doug Ptolemy webinar from a few weeks back. So envision your property as one small piece of a giant puzzle, which when assembled has the potential to form a beautiful and beneficial ecological picture. So the more, more of us that do this, the more corridors we create, more connections we create with our landscapes you know the 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 wild the wilderness areas can only do so much we need to we have so much private residential land in this country and we need to make connections and corridors for for this type of gardening and this landscaping for the pollinators that depend on these plants okay so enough about the why you all know that um let's get into the nitty-gritty here so uh, let's talk about the how, kind of just a, a brief overview of just some basics I was trying to think of for native plant garden design. And, you know, I got to admit, I'm still learning. Uh, it's, it's, it's always, always a, it's always a learning process and I'm definitely no expert. And, uh, but I've learned a lot in the last few years that I've been doing this and I hope I can impart some of that knowledge and that experience onto all of you. Um, so I think when you're thinking about native plant garden design, there's a lot of stuff to consider, uh, like with any gardening, but especially with native plant garden design. Um, and But these, I think, are the top five sort of things that you might want to really home in on and think about as you're planting your garden before you go out and buy all those plants at the Sagmaray native plant sale. Um, and I'll give an example of a design or a installation we did last year that kind of put holes all this together so number one get to know your site and its conditions uh this is you know very important um whenever we uh do a project we visit the home we visit the landscape we spend some time with it we get to know you know how much sun is gonna is there is it sunny is it shady uh even within one landscape there there it can be sunny and shady just depending uh, there's different microclimates happening. What kind of soil is there? You know, we tend to have pretty heavy clay here in uh, Chicagoland. Um, but, you know, it's always good to sort of test your soil or just figure out, like, you know, what kind of soil it is. And then you can do that with a simple soil test or even just, uh, a, you know, a hand test. How wet or dry does the area get? Will it be exposed to salt, you know, winter salt, uh, especially if you're planting kind of close to the sidewalk or in a parkway close to the street? Uh, what about harsh winds? What about foot traffic, dog pee? We do a lot of parkway, what they call hell strip between the sidewalk and street plantings, uh, gardens. And, you know, those are like the harshest environments possible. Salt, pollution, lots of foot traffic, dogs peeing. And so, you really got to take that into account um, when you're planning your landscape because um, not everything's going to survive in those conditions, but some plants will, um, or there's ways to sort of work around that. So number two, uh, think simple diversity. You want a mixture of plant species, but not one of everything. Um, diversity is key here, right? But you don't want to, I made the mistake when I first got, got into this, converting my front yard into a native plant garden. I went to the Peggy Notebart Nature Museum native plant sale. And I think I bought probably 60 different species of plants, uh, one of each, maybe a couple of, of few, and just put them all in. Um, and a lot of them never worked out. <laughs> uh, a lot of them worked out too well, uh, went a little crazy, um, but it was pretty much a mess. And so, you know, in order to kind of like turn people onto this and and convert the masses, we need to like definitely simplify. Vary colors, textures, and structures, but diversity is key. Like I said, different pollinator species may 
be more or less inclined to visit a bell-shaped flower, like on a columbine or a, a penstemon, over a flat disc-shaped flower, uh, like a golden alexander or, or wild quinine, and vice versa. Uh, number three, plant in groups. So groupings of individual species look better aesthetically, but they also make it easier for pollinators to find flowers in the landscape, especially in small urban habitats and gardens. I like to use the analogy of when you go to the grocery store, uh, your green peppers are usually close to your red peppers. They're not like completely across the store from one another. That is so we, that we can access them easily. And so pollinators kind of need the same thing. They want things, their, their specific plants that they like to pollinate and get food and nectar, you know, food from, they like those to be somewhat together and cl clustered in group. Um, plant for different bloom times. So this ensures visual interest, but more importantly, it's vital that something is blooming and available to pollinators throughout their activity season. And then also there's obviously winter time when there, you are leaving things standing and providing seed heads for the birds, overwintering birds and providing habitat for ha uh, overwintering insects. And then number five, think vertically, plant in layers, your structural layer, sort of trees, shrubs, tall forbs, your seasonal theme layer, which is your flowering plants, forbs, uh, your ground cover layer, grasses, sedges, ground covers, and don't forget your spring ephemerals, uh, which are all start, start starting to pop up now. Um, this is a sort of a graphic that is probably you've probably seen, maybe, maybe not, but this is kind of that vertical layer uh, sort of the design, thinking about that structural layer, trees, shrubs, you got the tall Joe pie weed there, then your seasonal theme layer, uh, sort of, you know, in between those structural plants, and then a ground cover that goes in between all of that. Uh, and what that does is that creates a plant community, which, you know, helps suppress weeds, helps the plants sort of support and uh, socialize with one another. And, um, you know, when you go into an actual like plant community, you don't really see much bare ground. And so that's what we're trying to emulate here. All those layers densely planted. Uh, so just real quick, this is kind of an example of a design that uh, I did last year uh, with Sag Moraine. And this was in Justice, Illinois, the Justice Park District Pollinator Garden. Um, I kind of want to just walk through this to sort of talk about some of the considerations I was thinking about while I was designing. So this was the space. It was against, it was a north facing garden against this building, this park district building, uh, 21 feet wide by 10 foot long. Um, north facing, like I said, so it had partial sun, partial shade, more sun on the edges, you know, that went from east to west, more shade closer to the building there. Soil was clay loam. It wasn't the worst soil, but not the best. Uh, but it doesn't matter. You don't have to amend soil. Uh, there's always the, the don't fight nature. Work with it. There's a right plant for the right place. Uh, so there, you see a downspout on the left there. So there's more moisture kind of by the downspout, sort of medium moisture in the middle, and then pretty dry. You can see where the grass is browning close to the edges. Um, the actual planting area sort of sloped down from the building to the pavement. So something to think about there, just slope and how you would work with that. Uh, not too windy because the building blocked most of the wind. Uh, and then one of the considerations was that, you know, I didn't want to plant anything too tall because they wanted some light to get into those windows that were about four feet high. I think that was like a conference or office room. And then obviously this is like a driveway in the front here. So they salted in the winter, and so that salt is going to get into the garden. So thinking about that for the plants on the edge, and also foot traffic, uh, that door to the left and door to the right, those are entryways. And so people are kind of walking, maybe cutting across, maybe, you know, walking on the edge. So thinking about that, too. All these considerations when thinking about this design or coming up with a design for this space, which is, what, 200 square feet, 210 square feet. Um, one thing that's valuable that I use all the time is Google Earth. Type in the address, get your satellite image, uh, zoom in. You can sort of see some sun and shade. Uh, I think there's a way to actually to show the sun as it goes throughout the year. Uh, and that you can also measure the space as well with Google Earth. Super valuable to tool. Highly recommend. Okay, so this was like a kind of a rough initial drawing I did, just laying out plants. 
um, first thing I did was they didn't want any trees really. So I thought, you know, thinking about those structural layers, I put in a couple of shrubs there because, you know, I, shrubs are very important, uh, you know, uh, plant to incorporate into your landscape, especially for habitat and uh, food for birds and um, things of that nature. So a couple shrubs, you know, lots of plants, lots of plants put in this. Um, taller plants kind of towards the back, shorter plants towards the front. A um, little bit more of the fall blooming plants towards the black, back, uh, spring plants towards the front, but not always, you know, sort of intermingled in there, but definitely groupings and clusters. So this is what it looked like kind of after I drew it all in and colored it before I labeled it. Um, and then the, here it is with everything labeled. And this was pretty much close to the final plant list and design. So as you can see, you know, we had the shrubs kind of in the back, uh, the black chokeberry and a common nine bark, both don't get too tremendously tall, but they'll provide some, some you know, fullness and like kind of serve as focal points. We had some switch grass to sort of soften the, the, the building there. And also to sort of, you know, have those, those beautiful grasses in the winter, which provide habitat and seed heads for the birds. Um, and, you know, this this was not a straight switchgrass. I think I actually went with a, a north wind switchgrass, um, which is a little less uh, aggressive. And uh, so, and then in the middle there, some New England aster, you know, kind of towards the downspout, the more moist area, some sweet Joe pieweed, which likes it a little bit wetter. And then right at the bottom of the downspout, you know, kind of beyond this little river rock swale, some cardinal flower and blue lobelia, which are, you know, moisture loving uh, native plants um, that don't mind getting their feet wet and they're, you know, do well and kind of part, part shade, part sun. Um, you know, also had some swamp milkweed or red milkweed there beyond that. Um, you know, incorporated some sedges made sure that there was something blooming at all times, right? So there's there's spring bloomers here, there's summer bloomers, there's fall bloomers, there's stuff that's gonna look good all, you know, hold interest all, all winter long and provide habitat, and provide food. Uh, right in the middle, there's a couple big cup plants that's sort of another structural plant. Uh, you know, those are, those essentially serve as like uh, bird baths, the uh, way the cups are shaped, the leaves are shaped. Um, so yeah prairie drop seed on the edges here, which does well in really dry kind of tough situations. So right there on the edge, uh, sunnier, drier area, same with the lead plant. Um, so yeah, that was uh, kind of the, the design and thinking behind that. Um, after considering all those, taking into all those considerations that I talked about before with uh, what the needs and the sort of uh, requirements of the space. And there we go. That's after we planted it, a bunch of volunteers and I. Um, I actually don't have any pictures since this planting, so uh, but um, supposedly it looks good. And, uh, you know, pollinators and monarchs have been flocking to it, and it's been successful thus far. Um, so when I was coming up with the designs, same with Keith for the uh, SAG Moraine, you know, we don't obviously, we obviously don't have a a specific like situation or site that we're thinking about. So what the kind of the challenge is to come up with a plant list or a design that can fit a different, uh, fit a bunch of different needs, right? Um, and so what, what I tend to do, and this is my third year designing for the Sag Moraine native plant sale. So I tried to pick plants that are more well-behaved, that are longer blooming, that are, just kind of more, more readily available um, and just more, I guess, in general, more successful um, and less aggressive and um, that, but that are also going to give you some beautiful blooms and some amazing habitat for pollinators. And uh, so, yeah, that's, and, you know, it's, it can't be a one size fits all for sure. So, you know, we did, three different designs we did a, or actually nine, but we did kind of three different themes, which is pollinator picnic, bird banquet, and then Keith did shady sanctuary. And we did a 10 plant group for each of those 20 plant group and a 50 plant group. 
Um, so yeah, and the same sort of thing, kind of like how are plants towards the back, shorter towards the front, incorporate some grasses, um, and make sure that something is blooming at all times. So I'm going to just quickly talk about some of the plants I chose uh, because everyone loves talking about plants and want to get into that before I hand it over to Keith. But these are some of the plants that I just kind of, you know, fall back on pretty frequently when I'm doing my designs uh, because they're just the tried and true, you know. Um, so Golden Alexander, Azizia aurea, you know, two to three feet tall, two feet wide. Um, my Golden Alexander in my garden, the foliage lasted all winter this year because it was such a warm winter. So it's pretty much, it can be semi evergreen, really. Uh, full sun to shade. So it's very adaptable. Medium moist soil, clay loam, blooms May, June. Uh, they have a long bloom time. Uh, gives the garden some well deserved early com color for several weeks, late spring to early summer. Uh, it's important to plant to a number of short tongued insects that are able to easily reach the nectar and the small yellow flowers. It's a host plant for swallowtail butterflies, black swallowtail, Ozark swallowtail, uh, kind of similar to plants in the carrot family, so carrot dill, things like that. Their caterpillars will feed on its leaves. It has fibrous roots and spreads readily by seed. So you might want to cut off some of the seed heads if you don't want it to spread uh, or give it competition. So plant densely around it with some sedges or you know other plants. Don't be afraid to plant right up against it uh, to give it the competition it needs so it doesn't spread as readily. Another one, foxglove beard tongue, which I think more and more is being called smooth penstemon, penstemon digitalis. Two feet tall, foot wide, full sun, partial shade, very adaptable plant as well. Once again, my the foliage on this, the basil leaves pretty much stayed ever, evergreen all winter this year for me again. Um, blooms June, July. Blooms perfectly in that sort of lull between spring and summer, you know, after the first wave of spring bloomers before the summer bloomers come in. So it fills in that gap really nicely. The basil leaves turn slightly purple late in the season. Uh, white tubular flowers, as you see, they're great for long tongue pollinators, such as bumblebees, hummingbirds, mason bees. Plus, the seed heads are absolutely beautiful in the winter. Um, they're, they're just like little rattles. They're gorgeous. Butterfly weed or butterfly milkweed. This is one that people ask me a lot about because it's it's kind of a tough plant, uh, especially to try to grow it on your own. Maybe Keith can talk about that. I'm sure he's, he's had better success than I have. But Love this plant because uh, it blooms from June to August. You know, it definitely requires full sun as far as I've used it. Um, likes likes it dry as well. So it's it's pretty, you know, resilient, tough plant dry once it gets established. But it does take a little bit longer time to get established because it, it has a tap root. Um, so sunny, dry location. There's not too many native plants that are orange. So that vivid orange color it's also has a low mounted profile, just makes it a very attractive plant to a lot of different pollinators. It's obviously a milkweed, so it's a host plant for monarchs. It does not contain the thick milky sap that a lot of milkweeds do. But like I said, be patient with it. Let that taproot establish. And also, it kind of likes to be just dotted around the garden, um, you know, amongst other fibrous rooted plants instead of clustered. So not a bad idea to put one or two here, two there, two there or something. Uh, another milkweed, and this one might be my favorite milkweed, actually. Swamp milkweed, red milkweed, rose milkweed, Sclepius incarnata. Gets pretty tall, three to four feet tall. Full sun, partial sun. I've grown it in my partial shade garden, and that does really well. Um, obviously, likes a bit of moisture, medium moisture, but once it's established, it's pretty tolerant, drought, drought tolerant as well. Great for a rain garden. Blooms July, August. Upright stems, long, narrow leaves. Fragrant pink flowers, kind of a vanilla scent. And then got to love those seed pods, you know, that are super, they're like, you know, mohawk punk rock seed pods in, in, you know, fall and winter. They're amazing. So important plant to many pollinators, host plant for monarchs as well, fibrous roots. Orange cone flower, uh, Rebecca fulgita. Um, this one, out of all, all the sort of the Rebecca's, I kind of like this one. I use this one a lot just because it blooms a really long time and, uh, you know, you could deadhead it to extend the blooms. Um, you know, it has these beautiful 
bold yellow orange flowers, deep green foliage, kind of has this mounding profile, uh, which is a nice structure in the garden. Great nectar source for many butterflies. Seed heads feed finches in the winter. Great plant, Rudbeckia fulgita, orange cone flower. Speaking of cone flowers, purple cone flower, although this is a different one. Echinacea purpurea, uh, kind of the, you know, this is, I call it the gateway native plant. Uh, this is just uh, pretty much a, a crowd pleaser, very iconic, easy to grow, blooms for a long time, looks great. Uh, put it in full sun, put it in partial sun, could even put it in partial shade, won't get as tall. Dry medium soil, clay loam, really can't go wrong with this plant. Favorite nectar source for butterflies and bees. And obviously the seed heads down there. I like to show the show the winter seed heads as well because that's important. You know, that's that's food and that's uh, you know, something that you look at all, you know, for half the year. So seed heads feed gold finches in the winter. And what I like to do is pair this one with pale purple cone flower, Echinacea pallida, uh, which blooms a little bit earlier and just segues perfectly, segs perfectly into the purple cone flower. And the two of them together are just boom, boom. Beautiful, great combo. Uh, great blue labelia. Uh, this is a great sort of moisture loving rain garden plant as I showed you in that uh, garden design. I had it sort of down by, by the downspout there. Um, blue, sort of violet, deep blue tubular flowers, flower spike from late summer to early fall, blooms July to September. Uh, I have mine at home kind of in partial shade by my back fence and it does great. doesn't get as tall. It's like three feet tall, um, but it's very happy. So uh, excellent for hummingbirds because it has those tubular flowers. Uh, so this is featured in the bird banquet. Uh, fibrous roots, forms colonies in favorable conditions. So give it some competition. Another plant that it really likes to hang out with is... Uh, like, oh, cardinal flower, uh, Lobelia cardinalis, so which is red. Uh, so the red and blue together. Very patriotic. Um, okay. Love Liatris. They're all great. Uh, this one I use a lot just because it's not as tall as a lot of Liatris. Doesn't seem to flop as much or really all that much at all. Um, and it's just a little bit different from the horn dog shaped ones. So I really like this one. Rough blazing star, button blazing star, Latris aspera. Full to partial sun. Also likes it dry. Uh, not a huge fan of clay soil. So, you know, if you can amend it a little bit maybe, or if you have a loamier spot, uh, uh, just don't put it in like compacted heavy clay. That's all I would suggest. Blooms August, September. Uh, like I said, shorter than other Liatris, covered with lavender, blooms in late summer. Butterflies, skippers, bees, hummingbirds are greatly attracted to the flower. The, the root system is a corm, so like uh, butterfly weed, which is a taproot, but this is a corm. All Liatris are, it's good to sort of like pepper these around the garden instead of cluster because they will socialize really well with the fibrous rooted plants, uh, kind of support one another and hang out and uh, yeah team up and mingle well. Um, getting more into fall here, New England aster, um, one of my favorite asters, and uh, asters, there's a lot of asters, and there's an aster for any situation, obviously. Um, I think Keith's going to talk about one for Shady. So New England is great, five feet tall, two feet wide, blooms August to October. Really uh, lights up the late season landscape, purple flowers, although I've seen them sort of lavender, shades of pink, violet, purple, all sorts of colors. Um, you know, it's an essential food source for pollinators. These late season uh, asters are, especially monarchs who are gearing up for their, you know, momentous migration, their huge journey. So asters and goldenrods, that's why they're so important in the garden. Um, the thing with the, the common complaint with asters, two complaints. One is that their lower leaves usually dry up, especially New England aster. So the way to kind of, don't worry, it's normal. The way to kind of get around that is plant more plants, plant plant, plant plants around its knees to sort of cover up those dry, dry leaves. And then also another issue that people have often with New England asters, if it's in a really pampered garden setting, which is most of our garden settings, it will have a tendency to flop. So something that you can do is cut the plant in half, 
in mid June it's called the Chelsea Chop, and uh, that will kind of encourage it to have a shorter, bushier habit and flop less. Um, fibrous roots, also prolific self seeder. So leave some seeds, remove some other seeds for control. Just provide, just give it some competition as well. All right, and then just a few more here. Goldenrod, like I said, asters and goldenrods, peanut butter and jelly, egg, ham and eggs, they go together like all of those things. Perfect combo. Um, I like showy goldenrod because it is beautiful, uh, blooms a little bit later, which is super important for especially monarchs and the late season pollinators. And it's not as aggressive as say like a Canada goldenrod or a stiff goldenrod that's spread by rhizomes because showy goldenrod has fibrous roots. So blooms August, October, beautiful yellow plumes, um, host plant for numerous moths and gall flies, which feed those chickadees and woodpeckers in the winter, uh, the larva of those flies. So Super important plants to incorporate in your garden. Any goldenrods and asters, definitely put them in there. Um, okay, getting into some grasses, which, you know, if your garden, I like to call grasses and sedges sort of like the two by fours of your garden. Uh, they're like the framing, right? So you're building your house where you put up the walls and the artwork and everything. You need, you need the framing, the two by fours. So... The grasses and sedges essentially do that. They provide the structure, they provide the support, uh, they provide just the year round uh, visual interest and, uh, you know, ecosystem sustenance, really. So, Spirobolus is a great uh, native grass, prairie grass, likes full sun, really likes it dry, does well on those edges or those borders. You know, this, this plant is great because it has a really uh, unique fragrance. It, some people say it smells like cilantro or coriander or maybe a little popcorn. Um, it smells great, uh, especially when it goes to seed. In the fall, it turns this beautiful gold color, and the seeds are a great food source for birds. Kind of has this mounding tussock habit that is great for a border or edge. And then finally, little blue stem, uh, which is another wonderful short prairie grass, same thing, full sun, dry soil, um, iconic native grass, kind of bluish green leaf color, upright form, provides excellent color all season long. And then, like I said, these grasses are a perfect backdrop for your prairie flowers. This one mounds as well, turns, as you see in the bottom there, reddish bronze in fall. Seeds for the birds, provides overwintering habitat, host plant for several skipper species, uh, also great to incorporate edges, borders, or just in and around the garden. So, you know, before, before you pick out your plants, prep, prepare your site. Uh, you could cut out the sod. You could sheet mulch. Um, there's a number of different ways. I'm not going to get totally into that right now. You can ask me questions if you want to know more about that. But prepare your site once you've determined where you want to have your native plant garden. Uh, incorporate ways that interact with your garden beyond just the plants, beyond just the gardening. So I always put, I love to put pathways through my gardens, uh, stumps, rocks, benches, features that will enable you to immerse yourself into the garden. You need to get in there and water things. So it's not only just accessibility, but that sense of connection to your landscape. So sit, watch, smell, feel, listen to your garden and the many creatures that you are now inviting and hosting into your garden. So the main thing is, is take your time, go slow, wait, then wait some more, get to know your space and the plants. Your garden is going to constantly change. These are not like your traditional uh, garden landscapes that you, where you set it and forget it, you know, plant here, then two feet of mulch and a plant there. This is a, a plant community that is always dynamic, ever evolving, always changing, and as is the environment surrounding it. Uh, native plants may take fewer inputs once established, but there will always be editing and maintaining. Just listen to the plants. They will guide you. There is a peaceful grounding in the process, uh, and it's all about care and patience. Uh, so as one of my favorite writers, Robin Wall Kimmer, writes, listen to the plants. They are some of our wisest teachers.
And that's all I'm going to say right now. So thank you. On to Keith. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Jeremy. That was awesome. Um, it's been really enjoyable working with you on these designs. Um, it's almost like when you're showing your project, I have so many similar jobs and it's just kind of fun um, seeing your perspective and kind of doing the same kind of work I'm doing out there. Um, so yeah, it's just a little bit of an intro about me. Um, I've worked in ecological restoration for about 12 years, um, started off in the field, worked my way up to a project manager, then started my own company. Um, I've also been growing plants. I started that as a hobby on the side about, about six, seven years ago. And in the last couple of years, decided to start selling my plants to the public. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here, and then we will um, we'll go through the presentation that I've got. Okay, excellent. All right, so we're gonna get started here. Um, there we go, okay. As Jeremy mentioned, he designed the, um, the you know, the the uh, the other two plant packages um, and I designed the Shady Sanctuary one. Um, the, what I'm going to do is for this presentation, we're going to go through all 12 species that are in the, the, the 50 plant package um, and just kind of just talk about each one a little bit, why I chose that for the design and why I think it works well. And, um, and maybe some fun and um, sprinkle in some fun facts about each plant as well. So, um, there we go. So yeah, when I was designing this plant package, these are the design considerations. Um, obviously sunlight. So these are everything that's everything that's in this plant package is for a, a shaded site. Um, a handful of these plants can actually handle full sun. Uh, plants like columbine and uh, wild geranium, they have a very um, wide variety of sunlight that they can handle. And uh, so they're, they're just great plants to put in almost any installation. Um, for soil types, you know, I'm thinking about when I was designing this, I'm really thinking about the homeowner and their typical suburban, you know, backyard, front yard, um, pretty much medium type soil. Um, everything in this is kind of goes from that medium wet to medium dry, you know, um, situation that you would typically encounter out here in the burbs um, or even in the city. And, um, you know, there's, so there's nothing like too wet. There's really no, you know, like water loving species in this, in this, in, in this design package. Um, some of the plants can handle a little bit of the drier soil, like the columbine and uh, some of the asters and things like that. Um, but that's, that was where I was really shooting for was kind of the middle, um, middle of the road for the soil. Um, I tried to get as many, you know, pollinator friendly showy forbs in there. Um, there are a few species of sedge to kind of give you some texture in the design as well. Um, a big, a big thing that I was thinking about with this design package is color throughout the season. Um, I wanted to make sure that you kind of had something in bloom throughout the year. It's a little bit tougher with the shady, with the shadier sites. You get a lot of spring ephemerals and early bloomers, and then you get a lot of nice things at the end of the season, like the asters, the zigzag goldenrod, um, those kinds of plants. The middle can be kind of a challenge, and so I'll kind of talk about that. You know, there's a species of penstemon and some geranium that's going to kind of bridge that gap. Um, I tried to go for things that were landscaping friendly. Um, so I didn't go too tall, you know, the Joe pie weed stayed out of the, uh, out of the design, same with like golden glow, things that get really big and aggressive. Um, cause I'm, you know, this is for a smaller area and, um, try to go with that. And then, yeah, I tried to keep it affordable. You know, I would love to put Jack in the pulpit and blood root and trilliums and things like that in the design, but those are really hard to get from the nursery. And if you get them, they're extremely expensive. So um, try to get things that were a little bit more, you know, readily available. All right. Okay, so the first plant I'm going to talk about is wild columbine. Um, this is one that many of you are probably familiar with. Um, it's got this beautiful red and yellow flower. It's an early season bloomer. It blooms in uh, in April and, and goes until about June. But once you get into June, it's pretty much, uh, you know, done, done for the year. Um, but it's a, uh, it's, like I said, about two feet tall, has some 
gorgeous foliage here. Um, you can use it, you know, like near a path or a sidewalk, you know, it looks good next to these landscape stones. Um, it is a host plant for the columbine dusky wing. Um, that's that uh, butterfly on the right there. It's a, the dusky wing is actually a skipper, so it's technically not a true butterfly, um, but it has more characteristics similar to a butterfly than a moth. Um, and skippers, just so you know, they get that name because they uh, they have kind of this erratic way of flying, um, kind of a irregular flight pattern. <laughs> um, but then, yeah, here's a here's a picture of its larvae, um, you know, feasting on the on the leaf, on the foliage here, and then just a really nice um, photo of one uh, landing on the flower there. So, um, another fun fact about columbine, which I think is good to know, is it actually will survive near pine trees. Um, it's hard to find find native plants that'll survive next to them. Um, uh, May apples is another one that I know does does well there. Um, other than that, it's kind of trial and error. And those are the only two that I can really think of off the top of my head that have some literature backing it up that they can handle that. Those those. You know, I'd mention that because that's kind of um, you know a, a good kind of a kind of a cool fact about this plant. And again, this one, I don't know if I mentioned it, but this is something that can, this is a plant that can handle full sun as well. So full sun all the way to full shade, this plant can handle. So it's really, really hardy. It grows kind of all over the place. Um, next one I want to talk about in the plant package is wild blue phlox, phlox de barricada. Uh, it gets about a foot tall, has these lovely kind of pinwheel blue, flow, blue flowers with uh, five petals on them. Um, looks great in a woodland setting. It's kind of a, com it's a companion plant to wild geranium. They, they're typical in the wild, found to be growing near each other. Um, I wanted to mention this is an early season bloomer. And around that same time, this, when, when wild blue flocks is blooming, uh, Dame's rocket is known to, to bloom. And that's a, uh, that's an invasive species that's in the mustard family. Um, and you can see on this slide, it's the one on the left. The big, the big way, the easiest way to tell the, the difference between a dame's rocket and a phlox is that the dame's rocket has four petals on the flower, whereas the phlox has five. Um, you're not going to really, I don't think you're, like wild blue phlox and dame's rocket, you're not going to really get those two mixed up because of the height difference. Um, the blue phlox blooms around the same time as it, but it's only a foot tall, whereas this gets to about three to four feet. Uh, the one on the right, Flocks below some prairie flocks gets about the same height. And as you said, it looks, as you can tell, it looks so very similar. But you don't have to worry as much because uh, flocks pelosa, that blooms later in the summer, you know, so you're not going to see those two. But it'll be funny because, yeah, the Dames Rocket's going to be going nuts here pretty soon in the next month. And people are, you know, a lot of people are probably going to mistake it for flocks and think it's pretty and keep it. And then, uh, yeah, wild geranium, that's, that's the next one I want to talk about. I, I use this plant um, all the time now in my designs because it's just a, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous ground cover. Um, it, uh, it actually, it has a pretty nice long bloom time. It starts in May and it will go into July. Um, it's another one of those super plants that can handle the full sun to full shade. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's just absolutely gorgeous. So, it, you know, it's got a nice flower. It's got a nice leaf on it. Um, this is a little, like one of those fun facts that I was going to tell you about is it has a fun way of how it spreads its seed. Um, as you can see on the left, it kind of starts with these like this like crane's beak structure where the seed pods are. Um, but then on the right, as they start to dry out those structures, they kind of become like a spring. <laughs> And the seeds are drying on the ends of those of those uh, like spring like structures, and eventually, you know, like the weight of the seed is kind of keeping it taut, and then um, eventually that seed will dry out completely, and it kind of rolls onto it, and then it gets catapulted across the air <laughs> to its new home. Uh, so it's kind of fun how these these seeds spread, you know, by by catapult. And uh, yeah, so I thought you'd get a kick out of that. I looked for a video, I could not find a, a good video online of it share. Um, so yeah, this is uh, Pensamen uh, hirsutus. And, you know, Jeremy talked about P Pensamen digitalis, which is a great one that 
you know, you see that everywhere. Um, hummingbirds like the, like these plants, uh, both, you know, all species of the penstemon, uh, they, they really like, they like those tube-like flowers to get in there. Um, this is one, as you can see, it's in full sun. So it's another kind of those, that super plant that can do full sun to full shade. Um, and it, I, I selected it uh, specifically for this plant package because it, it does it, it starts to bloom in June and goes into July and that's that's the hardest time of year to find um, blooming shade loving uh, forbs so that's why it's in here um, as you can see it, it kind of has it has hairs all over the plant like this photo on the left um, but it actually gets its name because it has the hairs on the tongue here of the of the flower so you can see that's a good photo of the the hairy tongue um, and um, looks great in the landscape. So we'll move on to the next species. Uh, Virginia bluebells. This is one that you're going to start seeing this pretty soon. If you haven't already, you know, they're probably starting to emerge already, you know, maybe not flowering yet, but, uh, they're coming. They'll be here soon. If you if you have them established, you're you know very fortunate. Um, you know, this is right here. When they start to flower, they um, about two feet tall. Um, they do form large colonies over time. Hey, Kate. Um, you know, yes. Kate Mason, when you turn your head to the left, we can't hear you. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. Yes. Hopefully you didn't miss too much. <laughs> Hopefully I didn't. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, with, with the, with the Virginia bluebells, they get about two feet tall. Um, they do form colonies over time. Um, it's a true spring ephemeral and, um, you know, Here's, here's, a, here's a great example of just, you know, a beautiful colony. I think anybody would love to look out their backyard and see that. Um, and you don't have to worry about it really taking over because you have, you have a plant with other things that's going to die back and, and then your other na native native forbs and uh, grasses and sedges are going to come in. So, Okay, next is uh, Jacob's Ladder. This one is... Again, kind of on the shorter side, it's about you know one to two feet tall. Um, it's an early season bloomer. It's in that April and May. It uh, unfortunately has kind of a short bloom time. You know, it has those beautiful flowers, but you only get to enjoy them for a short amount of time. Um, but it's really great for a landscaping situation because of its foliage. It'll it'll stay green all season long. Uh, it actually can handle some quite a bit of sun. If, it, if you put it in a sunny location, though, you have to keep it watered. Um, if, if you keep it in a you know more like moist woodland uh, woodland edge, it's going to do really well um, there, and you won't have to really think about it too much. But um, this photo, this is at a client's house, and it's on the north side, and you can see this is the end of summer. It's already seeded out, and it still has these nice green foliage, almost like a small shrub. So it's a uh, yeah, great to plant along the sidewalk, you know, any um, any kind of woodland edge. Yeah, so now I'm going to move into some sedges here. And the sedges are in the um, are in this plant design to kind of add some more texture to the design and to um, to kind of keep some evergreen type stuff going on as well throughout the season. Um, all the sedges are cool season, so they grow, you know, vigorously in the spring, and then they kind of go get a little tired looking throughout the middle of the summer, and then once we get back to fall, they start to green back up again. Um, and this is uh, Carex brangelii, long beach, long beaked sedge. It's a, it's a really, you know, it's just a great landscaping one. It gets about two feet tall. And those seed heads are really cool to look at. Um, and they also provide a lot of uh, food for small mammals and songbirds and, you know, um, all kinds of, yeah, <laughs> yeah, small mammals throughout the, throughout the season. Um, and it's got really nice long blade uh, foliage. This is, I took, I wanted to show this photo on the left because that's, that's a picture of what it looks like in the summer. Um, so you can see it gets a little bit tired looking, but it's, 
it's still there and um and it's going to provide some habitat and some texture to your design and then yeah you can see those those tasty seed heads over there on the right mm -hmm. um the next sedge i want to talk about is carex blonda um common woodland your common wood sedge this is one that's really hardy um it can grow full sun to full shade <laughs> Um, you know, really wet, really dry soil. Uh, it does fine in disturbed sites and like hard clay. Um, it's one that I know that uh, homeowners, like nobody can really screw this one up. <laughs> you know, you can put it in, it's going to survive. Um, you can even get a little aggressive in some of the, some of the disturbed sites, but it's, uh, it's one that's, that really adds a nice texture to the, um, to the, to the garden. And it has a little bit finer of a foliage to it. Um, you can see this photo on the left is great. You know, this is early in the summer, in the spring, where you got the bluebells and the trilliums up, and just a, a great texture to go with uh, go with your spring ephemerals there. And then you, you get a you get a closer look at the the seed head here on the right. Yeah. So yeah, and then this is the third sedge that I put in the in the plant design. This is uh, Carex rosa. The uh, curly styled wood sedge. Okay, again, it's you know very versatile. Looks great in a uh, in a landscape situation. It can tolerate dry to medium wet sites. Um, it gets its name actually because there's a, a slight rose tint to the um, to the seed heads, which I've got a uh, closer up. Yeah, you can kind of see on the right here, and that's how it gets the name Carex rosa. Um, there's another species species of sedge that I use quite a bit called uh, Carex radiata. Um, it looks very similar, but radiata needs a little bit more moist soil, so that's why I went with the Carex rosa for this design because I just want something that I know can handle these uh, these garden beds a lot better. And then uh, now I'm kind of moving away from the sedges, and we're going to get into our late season color. Um, so zigzag goldenrod here is um, is you know this is this is going to start this is going to start flowering in August into October. Um, it gets its name because it has these has a zigzag pattern of how the leaves attach to the the stem. It's nice how it kind of how it also flowers, you know where it connect the flowers, you know flower from the same spot where the leaves connect to the stem as well. Um, it's got these tooth margins along the leaves and um, the, the leaves are about four inches wide, about six inches long. Um, it can get a little bit more aggressive than some of the other plants in this in this uh, package. So that's why I only kept it to about three of them because um, it will eventually start to spread. Um, you know, I have, I know some other designers that design with native plants and they always want to include a, a little bit of goldenrod in their designs. Um, just because they do provide so much habitat for pollinators uh, late in the season, um, I've had one designer. She said it was, you know, they're like they're like little oak trees for pollinators. Um, so yeah, in this shaded garden, I definitely wanted to include uh, goldenrod. There's one called uh, blue stem goldenrod, which is another um, shade shade tolerant goldenrod that would work well as well um, if you have a shaded site. Yeah, and here's a close-up shot of the leaf margins. You know, they kind of got those sawtooth on, on the margins. Um, and the bees, yeah, they just, they go crazy over overall goldenrods, really. But um, yeah, this is a nice one in your garden. Okay. Um, Shorts Aster, I want to talk about this one. Um, this one gets about three feet tall. It's funny because it, you know, it gets so many flowers on the stem that, uh, the stems really can't support the weight and it just does this kind of floppy kind of moundy growth pattern almost immediately and it but it's nice it looks like kind of like a eerie cloud of flowers and it's really nice because it's in the it's in the fall when it's blooming um you know like just a nice like drift of color you know late in the season um that looks like that's actually a blue stem golden rod off to the left there kind of peeking through around the same time um yeah each 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 like each stock or inflorescence will have about ten to twenty pale blue violet um, you know little ray flowers on there or florets and they do they turn reddish reddish purple as they're kind of as they're aging through the season um, and goes yeah August to October um, 
just a nice, yeah, just a nice touch at the end of the season. And then I have another aster that I included in the 50 plant package. Um, this is largely faster. Stays a little bit shorter. Um, really only gets to about, you know, when it flowers, it's about, uh, about two feet tall uh, with these nice white flowers that it forms. I like this plant because it has these big heart-shaped leaves. It kind of reminds me almost of like, uh, like hostas and it stays green all season. And then you get that nice color at the end of the year. Um, it's uh, you, it can get a little bit of aggressive. You can kind of see in this photo on the right, you know, how it does sort of start to spread a little bit. Um, so that's one of your considerations when planting. You could probably plant them a little bit further apart from each other and let them kind of fill in the space. Uh, but it makes a great ground cover. Um, yeah, for your garden bed. There's a couple other photos, you know, it looks really nice against this tree here and in, in the woodland edge. Okay, so those were the, the 12 plants that were in the, that are in the, um, the Shady Sanctuary plant package. And um, I wanted to just show you a small project that I did last fall for a customer, um, just to kind of show you, it had a very similar planting list. So I wanted to kind of show you a job I did where I kind of, I'm kind of practicing what I preach here a little bit. Um, but yeah, this is a customer. They, they met me out at the uh, Naperville Farmer's Market last year. And um, they actually grew this, uh, this, this bur oak from acorn <laughs> themselves about 20, 25 years ago. They were, um, uh, Bill was coming, uh, yeah. The, the client was coming back from Indiana, grabbed some acorns, got them to germinate, you know, and then he planted a few in his yard. This one over here, here was another one and he ended up moving this one here. Anyways, long story short, you got a, you, you've got a traditional landscaping here. You got the turf grass, you've got, um, you know, Pachysandra here, Lily of the Valley. Um, and they wanted to convert this to native. So we, um, what we did to convert it was we actually did use herbicide to um, to kill off the pachysandra and the turf grass and to kind of kind of wipe the slate clean. Um, I think this one, the pachysandra, that's a tough one to get get rid of. I, I believe I had to do two treatments to really get get all of it. Um, and then for the prep work, what I did was you know we we took a string trimmer, we got rid of a lot of that turf grass, and then we actually tilled up. I used a small tiller to kind of break up all that Pachysandra root mass too. So we just really cleaned this, wiped the slate clean with this one. Um, you know, um, the fence post there, that's actually, we installed some some rabbit fencing as well with this project. But um, here you can see, this is what it looks like when it was all done. Um, and uh, what I did was we, we planted, um, we would get the, uh, the plants came in in packs of 10 and we designed it that way where we planted them in actually larger drifts of 10 of each species. So here you've got like 10, 10 pen sedges, you've got 10 large leaf aster. There were some species that were on back order. So I left an empty spot here that's going to go in the spring. Um, and yeah, I wanted to show this off because this is using a lot of the plants that are in this design. Um, we've got some columbine here. We've got some, uh, this is that Carex radiata. We've got um, zigzag goldenrod back here. We got that penstemon. Um, wild geraniums are in here too. So um, just to kind of give you an idea. And this is uh, the species list for that job. And as you can see, it's, it's quite similar. Um, you know, wild ginger, that's one that's not in the package that you could easily, you know, that, that, would, that would go really well with those other plants. Um, James Sedge was on back order and they actually are not growing that this year. So we're gonna put um we're gonna put Jacob's ladder in on this design. Uh so yeah, very similar kind of kind of job. But uh this is my contact information. So if you had questions about the, these plant packages or you're looking to do a you know a small a similar job at your house, or you know, you just want to talk to somebody um out here in the burbs that really wants to, you know, that that does a lot of this type of work, that's uh, that's my contact there. Um Keith at Stellar Natives. And at that, at this point, uh, my presentation is done. So if you want to kind of open up the questions, I'd be happy. Wonderful question time. Come on back, Jeremy. Um, before we get <laughs> into here. questions, 
from the audience. I just want to ask both of you to just give, like, thank you for giving your information, Keith. And um, would you both just give a little bit of synopsis of what services you could provide if people are interested in, in getting in, in, in contact with you? What are some different services that you provide? I mean, do you, you do, you know, would you do just strictly a design? Do you do anything remotely? Do you do, I mean, what are the various options if people want to reach out to you? Do you just a consultation to, you know, come and give them information at their house? What what can they call you for? Whoever wants yeah, to go first. Go <laughs> ahead, Keith. Go. Yeah. Um, no, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, so I... Majority of what I do is um, plant installations and then stewardship. You know, I, I I grow quite a bit of plants, as you can see. Like, well, that's the picture of my greenhouse in the back. But um, you know, I use a lot of those plants in my installations, and then I sell those also at plant sales and things. Um, most of my design work, though, is you know, it I, I don't I don't do a lot of uh, like concept drawings for clients. Most of what I do is I kind of come out. I meet with the client. I look at the, the situation that's going on on the site and, and I take a lot of photos and I take a lot of measurements and then I go back and I really, I basically come up with a species list for that client. And it's really based on the square footage um, of that, of the project area. And that, and then from there, I, I draft a proposal for them to do the work. So, um, and then with stewardship, I, I manage these kind of areas. I, I'll do, you know, wetlands, uh, prairies, woodlands, um, you know, I'll install shrubs, trees, and, um, yeah. And I always, I always try to work with, with, with natives as much as possible. Um, so yeah, those are, that, that, those are my services. Great. How about you, Jeremy? Um, so we do design installation and stewardship. Um, I, I will say that I, I'm on the North side of Chicago. So our installation range is kind of, uh, within the city for the most part. Um, but having said that, we uh, have done quite a few uh, remote design consultations where, you know, we'll come up with a design for someone um, and then I'll give them, you know, everything they need if they want to DIY it, install it themselves uh, or hire a local landscaper to install it. Um, and then we'll also help with plant sourcing and plant delivery, getting the plants to their house. Uh, so pretty much. Yeah. And then obviously stewardship as well for the, the gardens that we do install. Um, Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. OK, now some now some questions from the audience. Uh, whoever yeah. wants to answer or both. Uh, well, this seems this seems like a Keith question. How do the shade flowers do underneath black walnut trees? Ooh, yeah. Um, they do <laughs> kind of struggle. I mean, everything does. <laughs> um, so that that is a that is a major consideration. Um, you know, yeah, I haven't I haven't had to do. A, a, we, we've kind of avoided a lot of, you know, there hasn't, I haven't done a lot of installations underneath walnuts. Um, yeah. So that, that is something to think about. Mm -hmm. Okay. That was interesting what you were saying though, about under the pines with the uh, Columbine and then the May apple. And I'm, I'm thinking about it. I know a place, if, any, if anybody from this area knows this, the center in Payless, they have a lot of, um, pine trees there and there's areas where it's just tons of may apple and it just looks so cool when you see may apple in mass so that's such a good idea then i never thought of it but if to, to if, if, if you have a problem pine area those are great plants to go with i found that wild ginger does pretty well under mm. pine as well does it yeah um awesome. i don't know if that's your experience as well keith but i've I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, no that, yeah, that one, that one can handle a lot of acidic soil, and yeah, exactly. and that's that's a good one too because it stays green throughout most of the season. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas like the May apples are going to get kind of beat up and not look so good after they're done. Yeah, mm -hmm. so. for sure. Um, Scott asks, I heard you mention the Chelsea chap. Can that work for any tall native that gets floppy, or are there some that we should not attempt it on? 
Um, I guess this is for me. So, uh, so the Chelsea chop, I, I, it's so called because it's timed sort of with the what is it the Chelsea Flower Show, which is in what sort of uh, mid June, um, and the idea is to kind of chop down your later blooming flowers. So that's that's really what it's uh, it works best for uh, asters, golden rods, even like a Joe Pye weed, even like a, what's the what's one that we've used it for cut leaf cone flower so rubecchia lacinata um so most your your late blooming flowers fall blooming flowers um that tend to get taller and floppier can definitely benefit from it um ironweed is another one i've used it on um and so yeah it just it, it shortens them and creates sort of a bushier habit Wonderful. Yeah, so, I'll oh, go ahead, Keith. No, I was gonna say, yeah, I've had experience where I've, I've had clients like I, I there was an HOA I had at one point um, where we, we used to have to kind of cut things, do the Chelsea chop to everything along the shoreline, you know, for the residents that live there. And um, it's definitely certain species like like Jeremy said, the ones that get real tall and floppy, you know, those will bloom really nice. But then other stuff. Will, will still bloom, but it, it definitely has that chopped look to it. You know, it just doesn't yeah. look nice. So you got to kind of. So if you do that right to species. something like, can you do that to something? Let, let's say somebody wanted um, prairie duck. Can you do that with that? Or, or some of the annual sunflowers that get real floppy. Can you do that? And they'll kind of like mound and more sprout off mound. Did you do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, it'll still have like a chop center, you know, yeah, like it'll look kind of, Yeah, it's just <laughs> okay. Yeah, especially okay. when they have are those plants you're talking about the very like tall stem, right? That's, yes. Like, yeah, they're not as sort of foliage forward to begin with, I guess. So yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, so it, it wouldn't get it to like you know how you can kind of like Doug tell me says even if you can't you you can't fit an oak tree on your property because you don't have that much land you can plant an oak tree and then just cut off the header and keep trimming it like a shrub so you can have an oak shrub you're saying you can't do that with 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 some of those taller uh prairie plants i'm saying you can but they just it, it won't look as nice you know okay. <laughs> like you can it's just it's like they're still going to survive. That's the thing. That's what's so great about how hardy these plants are is they're going to survive. It's just from an aesthetic standpoint, some of them, they tolerate the Chelsea chop better than others where they'll, they'll yeah. come back and bloom and you won't even notice some of them. It's just like, Oh, it's, it's a shorter mountain mint and it looks really nice, but it's, right. you know, yeah. I guess, it's, I guess it's a question. Do you want it? Do you, do you prefer um, the flop or the chop? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. As far as like the how it looks, um, so yeah, it's kind of. So Debbie has a ton of good questions here, and they're they're all they're all great. So I'm just gonna, you know, do one at a time. Uh, can you talk about the benefits of native cultivars versus straight species? Um, I'll say what I think. Uh, That's all we want to know, Jeremy. <laughs> we're, gonna a, we're gonna have a big battle here. No, I mean... <laughs> yeah, it's the cups. I yeah, I mean, I I tend to uh, not use a whole lot of native ours. Um, you know, there's more and more research and studies coming out, and I think that's the best. That's the best way to sort of dust this all out is look at the the research uh, and the evidence. Um, I think uh, you know the biggest sort of character characteristic changes that uh that um have the most of effect is when uh there's flower color being changed so a lot a lot of the cone flower echinacea you know seeing all sorts of different types of flower colors uh and that is studies have shown that not as many pollinators are attracted or benefit from that as the straight species um but when it comes to i feel like height like the dwarf plants, uh, like a dwarf little Joe. Um, I've used that, you know, here and there. And I, you know, this, I think the research in the study showed that that does not 
uh, deter pollinators or have the same adverse effects. Um, and then obviously, so a lot of the native ours are bred for disease resistance or sort of to be less aggressive, right? Um, and so, and I'm, I, I think as far as I know, the studies and the research have shown that that, that is not as detrimental to pollinators. Keith, maybe you can chime in. But so I think it's more like color is a, definitely a big factor to, to avoid. Have they ever yeah, done I mean, research, I, like if, if, if a plant, if, um, in regards to a host plant, let's say that, you know, is such and such, uh, you know, coneflower is host plant to a certain, you know, type of moth, um, that if it's, uh, I mean, even if, even if the pollinators like it for food, will, um, the, do the larva tend to feed off of it as, as readily? Has there been any research on that that you're familiar with? I'm not really familiar with any research on that. I mean, I, I know that, um, you know, the native straight species evolved with the native insects and larvae. And that's why a lot of these, they, they can only eat the, they can only really feed off of the straight species. Um, so, you know, the native ours, they might have some aesthetic qualities that are good for the landscape and, you know, things like that. But if you're really, if you're, if you're trying to be hardcore about the pollinators and, and providing habitat, I would try to stick with the straight species as much as possible. Got it. How far do you space new plants apart? That's a good question. I, I used to, a lot of my jobs when I started off, I would do um, like one foot centers. Um, but I found that you can actually get away with up to about 24 inch for a lot of these forms um, because they do grow so fast and they kind of spread out. So it depends on how dense you want the, the planting to be. Um, so, so when you say you could go, when you say you could go 24 inches, even, are you talking about a pint size plant? Yes, a pint or even a plug. Yeah. Even a plug. They, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. They'll catch up. Um, you know, one gallons, I pretty much always do 24 inch um, centers, but yeah, it depends on how dense you really want it. Uh, some plants too, like the liatrices, you can get a little bit closer. It's probably better to do like a one inch or not, I'm sorry, one foot, <laughs> one foot uh, spacing for those. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I tend to plant fairly densely because, or encourage people to, because, um, and, and, you know, I sort of, I split the difference or sort of a foot and a half, really, kind of, mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, like Keith says, things will fill in quickly, especially with pints and plugs. Um, you know, you're, you're getting more bang for your buck when you buy uh, pints and plugs anyway. Um, and so, yeah, uh, there's nothing wrong with adding more plants. You essentially, you're creating a, a, a living mulch right and you really want that plant density to help suppress the weeds and retain the moisture and kind of work together um but yeah i mean obviously like some of the the bigger plants uh forbs can go two feet from one another uh gallons for sure yeah and, and also think about like brown cover type stuff you can spread those out a little bit more like the wild geraniums and canada and enemy and stuff um, right because they're gonna they're gonna want to they're gonna spread <laughs> like, yeah that's yeah. what they do how about relocating a plant if it, if you put it in the wrong spot and you want to move it is that very difficult because of the the root depth Um, I mean, I think with plants that have tap roots, like a, like a Baptisia, so blue wild indigo, or like a, a butterfly milkweed, um, it's a little more difficult. Uh, I've I've re relocated those actually. I just have to sort of be very careful. Um, but everything else, I, <laughs> I've really had no issues. Yeah, I was kind of laughing when you said Baptisia because I re I moved one for a customer and um, I kind of made a joke at the next customer that asked me to do that. They, I was going to tell them they can't afford it um, mm -hmm. because that tap root was, I mean, I was hacking at a thing with the shovel and it was, it was so hardy. But, it, you know, I got it out 
and yeah. um, I, I I moved it and it and it made it. it it's yeah. a great oh, wow. new spot. So you got to take like half the earth with it, you know. That's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do those have like the biggest tap root of any of the native plants you've you've worked with? The Baptisia. Yeah, probably one of the biggest tap roots. Um, I mean, something like Indian grass, or you know, like. <laughs> You know they're so they're so anchored in the ground. Um, you know I, I I remember working at an HOA one time and one of the people there the residents who didn't like the the big blue stem he's out there trying to yank on it and he couldn't get it out of the ground and it's just kind of funny because yeah some of this stuff is so so anchored in the ground yeah right um, this is a good question how far should your native garden area be from a neighbor who sprays their lawn? Ooh. Just move, <laughs> move away from that neighborhood. They're all over. They're all over. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I guess what's the drift zone, right? Yeah. Like how the, how you know, I mean, are they in spring, I guess. Right. Yeah. yeah. What yeah, I always I find was always a challenge is when they use um, the granular fertilizer stuff, because that stuff can wash in, you know, and that's always an issue. But I, I think what, what, if you got a situation like that, if you can put some kind of native grass buffer, you know, like, like side oats grama or little blue stem, um, kind of on the edge there, that's right. always a good thing if, you know, to kind of prevent, so if, if things wash in, because they will kill the forbs if it's going to get in, it's a broadly herbicide that's in that fertilizers. And along those lines, I mean, I think that's a good sort of border idea border planting transition plant you, you know idea to begin with to sort of appease the 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 neighbor who's not on, totally on board with this <laughs> and, you know kind of create that that transition uh instead of just you know a wall of seven foot tall compass plants up against like their, <laughs> your neighbor's property um yeah it's interesting because i had a client just frantically call me last week the that uh true green came by her property and spread all of that granular fertilizer in her newly planted native plant gardens that were planted last year by mistake uh no uh on purpose but and she does not have a contract with them at all and uh so yeah it was it it pretty horrible because like he said i mean once once it rains like that will just sort of you know go into the ground um she was out there with like a vacuum cleaner like like sucking oh, up the little pellets yeah. essentially mm -hmm. and you know documenting everything uh calling true green making numerous complaints but you know yeah one, one kind of one kind of pro tip too um and this goes back to, you know, my crew days and everything is if, if say you're spraying herbicide and you accidentally hit a, a native plant, um, a lot of times you can rip that part of the plant off, like the leaves that you hit and you'll save the plant, you yeah. know? So like if it gets sprayed by herbicide and you catch it early enough and you can even just chop it down, um, you're going to prevent that, you know, you're going to prevent the, the herbicide translocating and killing the plant. So you know, you, you hate to do that, but it's it's better than losing it. You know, right. that happens. Put cameras on your plants. Yeah. Oh wow! <laughs> True green coming. You think if you don't pay them, that why, why would they do something for free? But mm -hmm. just man, that what a nightmare that is. Do yeah. either of you do hardscape as well, such as paths, bird baths, and ponds? Uh, no hardscaping for me. Not yeah. really. You do paths through gardens sometimes, though. Yeah, I'll do we'll, we'll do paths through gardens, but you know it's uh, <coughs> it's more of an informal kind of stepping stone, flagstone, um, not really like brick paver paths or anything. Mulch paths. Yeah, I do a lot of mulch, a lot, a lot of mulch paths. Yeah. Other than the larger shrubs and grasses, how many of each species do you recommend planting in a 20 plant plot? So basically, if you're just going to do 20 plants, how many different species would you have in that? It really depends on what the, the look that you're going for. Um, yeah. 
you know, you might want, you might keep it real simple and pick like three, you know, and just kind of, you know, if you're going to do some mass plantings, have an early mid, you know, but, or you might, you know, if you want a lot of diversity, uh, you know, I think groups of three is a, is a good number, you know, if, right. so. Six, seven. Yeah. So you have about I mean, six the, or seven thing, different species there. The thing to think about is, yeah, definitely plant for spring, summer, and fall, right? So even if it's just three species, represent those three seasons if you can, and then sort of build up from there. Two species for spring, two for summer, two for fall, three, 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 or two, four, two, you know? Mm -hmm. In light of the upcoming periodical cicadas, oh. do you have any? Oh, I lost the question. Wait, my question's moved. Uh, yes, the there we are. The do you have any concerns or tips for protecting a newly established native plant garden? Will they bother Forbes or are they just after woodies? They're just after woodies, um, especially young trees. So I've, I've had a lot of clients ask me about this. Uh, this right now um, and uh, I've been sort of recommending either uh, delaying planting new trees and shrubs till fall or they're adamant about planting them now um, you know covering them with some sort of fabric at least during that emergence time because the the females what they do is they lay their eggs they what cut slits into the the young twigs and the bark usually you know half inch or 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 in diameter or smaller uh that's what they're looking for and uh they'll lay their eggs in there and obviously that can uh destroy the the tree with the amount that we're expected to see um but so yeah you can uh you can wrap the branches of newly planted trees or shrubs in like a like a cheese clothy like totally fabric type you know if you want um or just wait which is totally fine i don't know keith what are your opinions on this yeah, i'm basically telling my customers the exact same thing um i've got a, a couple that we did a ton of shrubs last year so we're going to be put the client bought a bunch of netting and we're going to be covering those old co you know as much of service barriers we put in and all kinds of stuff so yeah. we are going to protect those um and then, yeah, trying to hold off to at least after June to plant. But, you know, fall is such a great time to plant shrubs anyways. Um, so if you can hold off till then, that's it. Yeah, I would yeah. recommend it. Really, the difference between planting them now or fall, you know, is it's not that much uh, of a difference. So it's, uh, yeah, if you can wait till fall, go for it. It's just going to be very loud, too, and crunchy. <laughs> you guys are going to have a gay old time out there all spring on your hands and knees planting with with all of like, those <laughs> yes i scoop them out of the way yeah and get to it's going to be yeah. raining cicadas on us <laughs> uh, <laughs> what is it possible to to put native plants in more of a formal design in the front of the house and if so what considerations would you make would you take for that um this person's area is mostly dry soil in part sun yeah i i would use you know less is more you know um and i would use the the, the really like well-behaved natives so like um like rebecca fulgida like um the, the orange cone flower that jeremy showed you know that's a great one that is just going to kind of stay put um not get too tall you can kind of space those out um, you know, Pensament Digitalis. Yeah, there's a bunch of these. Uh, I would go with something a little bit on the shorter side, well behaved. Um, and then yeah, you got to think about those those soil and light conditions. Um, you know, any recommendations that you have, Jeremy? Or yeah, um, I mean, kind of thinking about more, like you said, well behaved, sort of mounded plants. I, I really like like lance leaf coreopsis is like a a nice one put in full sun. Um one that's like prairie drop seed, you know, that mountain grass seed. is perfect for any like landscaping situation. Yeah, obviously the cone flowers. Uh, one that I think is pretty underrated is our native coral bell, Hucara mm -hmm. Richardsoni, right? Um mm -hmm. I mean 
it's not super showy, but it's a great, like just well-behaved filling plant. And then it has a yeah, nice leaf on there. Yeah. Leaf mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, it's super adaptable. And, uh, yeah, I like to plop those in here and there, uh, kind of definitely front yard more intentional settings. So you're telling everybody, both of you, I hear you saying that it is possible to have a, a to create a more formal, neat native garden in a front yard. Oh, definitely. yeah, I, I think it, it, the the rule is to kind of go go simple, you know, like so, like mm -hmm. like the wild geranium, you know, pick a spot, let it kind of grow and kind of fill that area, and then you know, pick another spot and do some spirobolis or you know, so. It's possible. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, Probably. Carol asks, hi, Carol. Um, she, you guys mentioned like she has many Rebecca Hertas and she never sees any pollinators on them and always wonders why. I, I'm just wondering if maybe they just are preferring something else she's got out there. Hmm. Or do you find that there are certain species of, of Rebecca that the pollinators seem to like more? Uh so I, so Rebecca Herta is an interesting one to me because it's it's actually more of a biennial. Um, right. So like when I do it, when, I, when I'm doing like a seed installation, we you know we put a bunch of that next. It's one of the first to germinate. It's so like that first year when you're doing like a, a brand new prairie or whatever, you're going to have all these beautiful Rebecca is the first year, um, but they kind of get pushed out over time. So I don't I don't. I don't plant them in like a landscaping situation. I usually use uh, Rebecca fulgida or Subtimentosa are my two go-tos. Sometimes Triloba for like a shadier spot. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, that's an interesting question about the, you know, I, I don't know if I've noticed if, if it gets less attention from pollinators as the other Rebeccas, you know. Um, I know that- Mine does not that get use, a lot, yeah. but I get a lot of attention on my, on. Rebecca Herta of soldier beetles. I get a lot of those on there, oh, okay. but not a lot. But not a lot of the other pollinators. Yeah, I yeah, I just don't think Herta. I don't know if it's because it's a biennial, just doesn't attract as many pollinators. Um, so, would the orange cone flower you had put in your designs be? Would do you think that attracts more? It all depends, but I, I would. In my experience, I've seen pollinators on on the ones that okay. I planted for sure. I, I, you know, I know Sentimentosa brings in a lot. <laughs> that one gets a little bit taller, like four feet tall, but that one, yeah, they go nuts on that one. Yeah. Well, that's there the you one go, thing. Carol. You got to switch up. You got to switch it up. Six feet tall. Yeah. Um, any advice? This is a good question. Any advice for a full shade backyard due to many Baroque trees? We have a lot of mud and can't seem to grow grass. I would love to use native plants as ground cover landscaping instead, but don't know what will work. Well, yeah, I mean, a lot of what I showed in my presentation, you know, I think would work well there. A lot of those sedges. Um, yeah, take a look so at the plants that are in those designs, Libby, that, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, that's what it's... So Lydia is asking, where do bee balm and cat mint fit into a native plant landscape? I have both and the bees seem to love them. Well, cat mint is not native, but is it Mediterranean, I believe. Um, but, you know, if, 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 if it's happy and you love it, uh, no problem. You know, that's, that's like that question before, like kind of, you know, um, uh, incorporating this into a more formal garden aesthetic doesn't mean you have to take everything out. You can leave in your cabinet, you can leave in your, your okay. some of your salvias and stuff, you know, but add some other natives or, amongst that. Um, bee balm is great. Um, I've, you know, uh, there's wild bergamot, which is uh, kind of the most popular, I think, bee balm, but I've really be grown to love uh, Monarda punctata, which is also called spotted bee balm or horse mint, shorter. Um, I like to pair that with purple cone flower. They look awesome together. Um, and then even Monarda bradburiana, right? Which is, uh, mm -hmm. what is the common name for the Eastern bee balm, I think. Um, uh, or Bradbury's bee balm. Or Bradbury's or, yeah. bee balm, yeah. Also a shorter bee balm. I've, I, I've 
my experience with both of those is they don't get the powdery mildew as much as the bergamot, the Monarda fistulosa gets. Um, uh, but that maybe that's just because I had them in really like sunny areas that were just well ventilated. Um, but yeah, bee balm is the bumblebees go nuts. I love it. Just yeah, watching I mean, you guys dialogue back and forth about it, I, I I was thinking, I wonder if these guys ever go out for a beer and just talk native plants. Yeah, well, how did your such and such do in the shade? It's <laughs> good. I'll meet you at your greenhouse. Yeah, yeah, you should come over. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, and here's one that I think uh, everybody can relate to. Well, a lot of people can relate to. Do you have any secret advice for how to deter rabbits? Is there a silver bullet we don't know about? They attack so many of our newly planted native plants and smaller newly planted shrubs. Yeah, it's um, the fence. You know, I, I get that question. Obviously, I you know I sell plants at farmers markets and stuff. So that's like the question I get all the time. And um, you know, rabbits. There are some species like the things in the mint family, like the, the bee bombs and things. They tend to leave those alone a little bit more so. Um, but if they're hungry, they'll eat anything. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I've seen them, especially this last year, I've seen them eat penstemon. I've seen them eat milkweed, you know, things that I didn't really see them eat in the past. Um, so it's, I think if, you know, and I'm sure Jerry, Jeremy would agree, like, you know, the solution maybe is having more plants. I know that sounds kind of funny, but if you have like the one lone cone flower and it's all surrounded by turf grass, it's like the, the rabbit can't resist, you know, but if you've got you know, something going on there and you got quite a bit, I don't think you'll even really notice, you know, once they're established. And yeah. Is there any species you guys have noticed to really, really though be rabbit resistant where you've just never seen the rabbits go after them? Well, the Monarda, that was, that's, Monarda. that's probably the top of the list for me. Um, I, it doesn't okay. seem like they ever really bother that, you the know. Anthem, um, the mountain mint, the different mints, uh, mm -hmm. they seem to resist. I, you know, that obviously the more fragrant the plant seems to deter them as well as the deer, right? But like Keith said, I mean, I feel like our rabbit and deer around here are just another level of of, of hangry. <laughs> so, <laughs> and like, um, yeah. I, I, I agree. Overwhelm them with plants. Shock and awe. Just plant them. <laughs> you know, yeah, it, it kind of, you got to kind of create like decoys and, and trap plants to sort of, you know, deter them from eating the stuff that you want to keep. So. Well, the, Beverly says the best deterrent of rabbits is hawks. There you go. And, which is true. So if you have a lot of bird food, nature's yeah. bird food you're going to have hawks hanging out because they're going to be after your birds and it's all it all makes the world go round and i guess you would probably have less rabbits too um uh and then sue asks she's looking to attract butterflies she has cone flowers planted as well as butterfly bush and i'm just going to leave that hang there in case either mm -hmm. of you want to like jump on that um, and last year she saw only one monarch butterfly. I'm just going to add to that. Their numbers are down again. Their numbers were down estimated 54% this year. So uh, another yeah. over last year. So we really got to get that milkweed in our landscapes, guys. We really, please, please, please plant, plant, plant a spot of milkweed, everybody listening. But did you want did either one of you want to discuss um, butterfly bushes and how many of them you use in your designs? zero <laughs> yeah i've had I, I i've planted them for customers that wanted them and then i i have a lot of problem with them surviving um it seems like i have I had to replace them i don't know so i know yeah, that you want, i think they're in some places they're considered invasive i've mm -hmm. never had that problem but i don't know doug Tallamy always says they're like it's like eating mcdonald's for yeah, butterflies it doesn't it's give them food yeah junk food butterflies there's it's all style and not much substance or sustenance um i mean they might be covered in butterflies but it doesn't mean that it's it's good for them uh it's not providing the, the type of nutrients and protein that the butterflies really need um so yeah it's a sugar plant so Try to stay away from those if you can, and plant milkweed instead. We want to we want to send those monarchs off on their their 
winter migration and give them the best the best chance of making it. And that's not going to be on the nutrition from butterfly bushes. It's going to be on the nutrition from goldenrod and asters. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, one, one thought on that. Um, I've, I've really come to come around and really like uh, world milkweed. It almost, especially on these drier sites, it almost gets shrub like, you know, in a way I've, I've really been impressed with that. And that. That might be a good, you know, that might be a good option if you don't want to do it. If you want something a little bit more shrubby, but milkweedy, you know, but, but an actual milkweed, um, world milk wow, might ward, be more... ward milkweed it gets a little bit shrubby. Yeah, like the interesting yeah. yeah, I'd like to. I want to try some of that then. And it and it holds up to a decent amount of shade too. Actually, I I have it in my sort of front yard, shadier area, and uh, it doesn't get as shrub like as you know it would in full sun, but it, um, still does its job and the butterflies love it. And if, oh, we have one more. Um, do we need more than one species of milkweed for the monarch butterflies? I know for for some reason, Doug Taylor says it's good to have like two or three species. Mm -hmm. Yeah, start I don't with... know. I don't know if it matters because, to be honest with you, every time I find an egg, it's on my swamp. Right. Um, it, start with one, and go from there. <laughs> just keep adding, as as you go. But but yeah, just just make make the leap with the one at first. Um, but yeah. And if you guys don't mind indulging me, I just want to, this was something that you had mentioned when you were talking, Jeremy, and I just wanted to finish off. Would, would you just talk a little bit about more, a little bit more about, about, because I, I just think it's so cool. And I don't know that, that everybody realizes that these, these native plants that co-evolved with each other, they really, they really form communities and they grow better with each other. And, there's 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 like there's a real relationship that 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 exists and would you just talk a little bit about about a native plant community and what what that is and how they benefit each other and how they interact with each other some people that sounds kind of spooky all these plants out there talking to each other but they really kind of do yeah absolutely um yeah i mean when you go to any woodlands or uh, a, any prairie restoration or remnant that's that's left, um, you know, what you don't see is acres of mulch everywhere, right? And with individual plants here and there. Our, our gardens do not, tend to not represent what nature is uh, and what it wants to be. And so, um, you know, the, the more that we can emulate those native plant communities that exist, uh, uh, you know, around us. And that would be, I would say that I would recommend that to everyone as far as, far as like considerations for design, uh, go visit some of these, uh, you know, native plant communities um, that are in and around your area. Um, there's a list on my website or you probably have, there's probably a list on Sag Moraine as well. Um, and just observe, like through different seasons, observe how the plants interact with one another, how 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 the the communities change, how the plants, um, you know, are dynamic, and how some will, uh, you know, just kind of be the focal points at some times, and others will sort of rise and fall, and it's it's all it's all it's all connected, and. Uh, you know, I, I think that that's probably the best thing that anyone could do is in their research and just, you know, just for their own sort of uh, experience and knowledge, just get out there and observe and 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 look at these plants in a, in a community and try to bring that into your own ho home landscape if you can as much as possible. Um, Keith? <laughs> yeah, so... Um... One of my recommendations is um uh, this book, the Plants of the Oh you can't see it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, Plants of the Chicago Region, uh Swinking Wilhelm. Um the thing about this book, what they did was 
they, for every species of plant in the Chicagoland region, they actually put down their known associates in the wild. So mm -hmm. if you really want to get hardcore into this kind of stuff, you know, you can say like, oh, I've got some, you know, some blue flocks in my yard or, you know, you got something already. You kind of, you can go like look to this book and see like what naturally is found in the wild with that species. So if you really want to get into that, um, you know, that's, you know, we're lucky that we have that this book exists <laughs> for our region, that we have um, all of our plants categorized and the kind of communities that they naturally evolved in or have been found with each other. So um, that's something that's, that's an option. I'm just saying. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you, guys. This was this. I know this was a wealth of information. And thank you guys for getting us started this spring and now i just can't wait to get out there <laughs> <laughs> it's coming it's coming it's coming it early too yeah yeah for nice. sure but thank you so much and everybody if anybody has any further questions or information or wants to 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 check out um jeremy or keith's services uh, in your own uh in your own yard Again, please reach out to them. You can also find their information on the resources section of our website. And uh, we'll see hopefully some of you next week for our next webinar, which will be how to help monarchs in your yard. So anybody who has questions about milkweed, we're going to be doing a deep dive on all kinds of milkweed and other things monarch related. So with that, I will say good night, everyone. Good night, Jeremy. Good night, good night Keith. Night. Yep, thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Always a pleasure.